It's time to begin. Hello, back country. <laughs> you remember I told you about that Korean preacher that said if you'll come down to the front, we'll tell you why no one sits on the back benches in Korea. They rushed down there and he said, we don't have any benches in Korea. <laughs> All right, the book of Ephesians, we have finished Galatians, take the next epistle, also of six chapters, Ephesians, one of the deepest books in the entire Bible. And I mean by that, you have to study ardently and thoroughly to really get the gist and thrust of this book. So I hope that uh, we're going to have a great study, and what I plan to do is give an overview, a background Go back to Acts chapters 19 and 20 where the gospel came to the city of Ephesus. Tell you a little about Ephesus itself and the Ephesians and the other references in the New Testament to the Ephesians and uh, overview the book. And then Sunday morning in Bible class, we'll take chapter 1. So continue to be studying and we'll take it verse by verse. Then Sunday night, we're planning on doing Ephesians chapter 2 in our sermon, the points therefrom. One reason the book of Ephesians is so deep is its major thrust is called God's eternal purpose. It takes us back before the world began. In the eternal mind and purpose of God, uh, to realize, according to this book, what he purposed in the future for the world and its inhabitants. And so uh, when we understand that the theme underneath God's eternal purpose is Christ and the church, Christ and his church, we realize that such was planned and purposed in the mind of God before the world began. So if we're members of the New Testament church, not of a movement that was begun in America or Europe in the 1800s or late 1700s, if we realize that the true church of the living God purchased by the blood of Christ, Acts 20, 28, and that's what Paul said to the Ephesians elder, Ephesian elders when he spoke to them, uh, the church which Christ purchased with his own blood goes back before the world began in the eternal purpose and mind of God. So if we are New Testament Christians, then we're tied on to eternity. And this is another reason, and listen carefully, because I never thought I'd have to say this to my brethren, that's another reason one church is not as good as another church. I never thought I'd live to see the day when members of the church would act like that the church of Christ is just the best denomination of them all and to begin thinking interdenominationalism instead of undenominationalism. But we have folk like that that uh, would say that what we believe as a congregation here is so old fogey and so old fashioned that it's unbelievable that intelligent people could still believe those things. Many, many years ago, I was taught about the New Testament church from the New Testament. And since the New Testament has not changed one word since the first century, then uh, I don't mind anyone saying, you're so old, fo old fogey and old-fashioned, you still believe what you heard years ago. Well, if what I heard was the truth, yeah, I believe that. I've not learned one new thing from the Bible because it teaches just what it taught when I was a boy. And if there's anybody here older than I am since you were a boy. So when we talk about uh, the book of Ephesians, we're talking about eternity and the mind of God and what he willed before the world existed and before man existed. That's why the word predestined is used a couple of times in this very first chapter. That means before the world began, the eternal destiny of man was already purposed in the mind of God that Christ would come, that the gospel would be preached, that the church would be established. And that's why this is such a deep and rich book. You have to tune in to eternity and go back beyond the scenes of time as men count time. <laughs> Chapter 1 speaks of the church as the fullness of Christ. Chapter 2 speaks of the church as the reconciling body of both Jew and Gentile. We're reconciled to God in the church in the one body by the death of Christ. Chapter 3 says we glorify God in the church. And he's not talking about a building. We should have a long time ago dropped the vocabulary that's false that says, isn't that a pretty church? We went by the church. They had a wedding at the church. 
Now, this is a meeting place, a building. You can meet in a barn in someone's house. I've met in places like that. Rented halls, brush arbors, open camp meetings. So this is not the church, and you can't even accommodatively call it that. This is a meeting place where the church gathers. But the church could gather anywhere. And many of them have, I've met in rented halls all over the world. And uh, in Adelaide, Australia, a city of a million people, we had one of the nicest rented halls in all that city, but it was a rented hall. We didn't own it. We just paid rent on it month after month. And we did quite well because the people over there didn't believe you had to have a cathedral or a fancy building or waste $2 million of the Lord's money for something to our own social poise that should have been spent in evangelizing the world. We did quite well without a fancy building on a good location. We have some brethren today that not only speak of the building as the church, they really kind of think like that. And they believe we're going to save souls because we have a fine building. The gospel is God's power to save. So when it speaks of Christ and the church, in no place is it speaking of a physical edifice. It's talking about a spiritual building of people, not a brick and wood and mortar and stone. And then in chapter, at the end of chapter 3, he has the key verse in the book, and I hope you'll be memorizing it, 321, Unto God be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. So when we speak of being members of the church you read about in the Bible, we're talking about something that's older than time. It's an eternal situation, an arrangement. And then in chapter 4, he speaks of the unity of the church. One body, one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father who is above all and through all and in you all. The singularity of the platform, the key points of Christianity. And then at the end of chapter 4, he discusses practical things about telling the truth and loving one another and uh, how we need to control our passions and our lives and our attitudes. Very, very practical. Then in chapter 5, the church is the bride of Christ. One of the most clarion calls for purity in all the Bible. He likens or compares the husband and the wife to Christ and the church, the bridegroom and the bride. Question, how many brides did Christ have? He wasn't a bigamist or a polygamist, so he must be speaking of singularity, and he is. And so this not only takes care of denominationalism as being absolutely false, and not a true picture of Ephesians 5, but also speaks to Christians about how many marriages we ought to have, and how we ought to keep intact that uh, marriage vow that we made a long time ago, one man to one woman for life. And that would take care of the divorce problem in and out of the church today. And so this is a powerful book. Then in chapter 6, and we preached on this about three months ago or somewhere like that, the army of the Lord, and there are a lot of brethren that don't even have a clue that Ephesians 6, especially beginning with verse 10, speaks of the army of the Lord. Christ is the commander. The Bible is the weapon. And uh, how we're to fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on eternal life. The church is the militant arm of God. That is, not in carnal combat, but in spiritual combat against spiritual wickedness in high places. And we have some brethren today who believe the church is a glorified social club and we should never condemn error, never fight the devil, never act like there's any evil in the world. Just kind of sing a happy tune and whistle past a graveyard. And that is a tragedy that so many of my brethren have never, ever once considered Ephesians 6. The church is the army of the Lord. And all that's in the book of Ephesians. But let's go back and get some background. I think we'll appreciate many of the passages and words even that we come across in our study. In Acts chapter 18, Paul left Corinth after a year and a half. And much good was accomplished there in that wicked city. Many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized, Acts 18.8. But then he goes to Ephesus and stays some two years and three months. He generally called it, as he talked to the elders of Ephesus in Acts 20, I was with you three years, night and day with tears. 
And while he was in Ephesus, the brethren in Corinth sent him some written questions for him as an apostle to answer since they didn't have access to the New Testament, the completed Bible like we do. And so they sent some questions to him in Ephesus from Corinth for him to answer for them as an apostle of Christ. In Ephesian, in Ephesus, which had one of the seven wonders of the ancient world in it, the beautiful marble temple erected the goddess Diana, people all over that part of the world, which would be Turkey and Greece today, would come there for the beauty of that temple that reflected in the water in front of the 127 pillars that surrounded it that had been given by different rulers, kings, and monarchs of, the, of Europe at that time. And uh, it was a magnificent place. But it was also, because of that, given over to idolatry, and Demetrius, the head of the silversmiths guild, was making money hand over fist, as we say today, with little statuettes of the goddess Diana, or Artemis, if you use another language, parallel. Uh, and uh, when Paul came there and preached the one true and living God, and against idolatry, uh, while the silversmiths guild was so angry, they wanted to kill Paul, and pressed him toward the theater or the arena, and were going to put him to death, but one person had a cool head and said, what will we report to Rome, which they had to do for any fracas we have here, why are we going to give an account that this man did that was unlawful and broke Roman uh, law? Their point was is hurting their po pocketbook and 50,000 pieces of silver worth of curious arts and idolatrous things were burned in the middle of the street and Demetrius and others could see their means of gain was about gone. It was a tumultuous time for Paul. While there also, and we usually forget about this, it's a unique, uh, one-of-a-kind thing in the New Testament, the book of Acts. He taught in a school called the School of Tyrannus. There are those who believe that this helped spread the gospel all over that part of the ancient world because it, as best I can uh, ascertain and study from background material, it was kind of like a trade school. And people all over that area, like from Laodicea and other places like that, uh, Colossae and all, came there and in their trade guilds, they were taught a trade, and then they also had maybe a, a school, which say maybe at break time or at noon or something like that. They would also be able to learn some things about reading and application in a practical way. A lot of people are not aware of this, and this might help explain something. It might, might be encouraging to you. Did you know the phrase Sunday school in its origin had nothing to do with the Bible? You'll never hear me say Sunday school an attachment to the church of the Lord. You'll never hear me say, let's go to Sunday school. Uh, if we get a board to put up there and it says Sunday school, I'd like to change it to Bible class. And there's a reason for that. I'm not just being arbitrary. But a lot of people don't have a clue about what I'm about to tell you. Sunday school was started by a fellow in England named Robert Rakes. It had nothing whatsoever at all to do with the church or with the Bible. It was a school that was given in the Industrial Revolution where little children who didn't have time to go to school, they had to work in the mills and in hard work, 10, 12 hours a day. They didn't have time to go to any kind of a school to ed be educated. So Robert Rakes introduced a school that would be on Sunday so these workers, most of them little children, could be taught to read and write and so forth. So the origin of the phrase Sunday school had nothing to do with the church, with the Bible, with anything like that. But people adopted that when they started having classes and so forth in congregations. And so the background of that has nothing to do with the Bible. And what do we do in Bible classes? We study the Bible. I'd a whole lot rather be historically and biblically more accurate than to just pick up something passed down by denominationalism that has nothing to do with the New Testament. You'll never find that phrase in the Bible. But it was good that these children were being taught basic fundamentals of what we'd say the educational world. They'd honed their skills in back-breaking work and secular concerns, but they were left out of the educational process. Well, maybe the school of Tyrannus was something like that, but Paul taught the scriptures and as a result helped spread the gospel through his teaching in this school all over that part of the ancient world. So these are some things about the background of Ephesus. 
History also tells us that John the Apostle, to whom the care of Mary, uh, the mother of Jesus, was given by Christ while he's on the cross, lived in Ephesus the last 40 years of his life. And everything I've ever read about him was as he grew older, he even grew finer and better and deeper and richer and kept his commitment to caring for the mother of Jesus. Uh, but Timothy, who was sort of Paul's son in the gospel, was sent by Paul to Ephesus because he was a mother's boy and shy and timid because they already had elders in Ephesus. And so first and second Timothy has this background with the Ephesians. And the book of Revelation was addressed in part to the church at Ephesus. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Because of this book in First and Second Timothy and Revelation, there was probably no congregation in the first century so especially blessed as the church at Ephesus. So we're talking about something that's rich in background besides the content of these six chapters. And if you'd read carefully as you begin in Acts 19 when Paul left Corinth and came to Ephesus, the first thing he did was baptize 12 men into Christ who knew only John the Immerser's baptism. I was reading again the other day in a periodical about John's baptism, and some people say that anyone baptized of John's baptism prior to Pentecost had to be rebaptized on Pentecost. I don't believe that. That would make John's work absolutely unimportant, zero minus zilch. Why would he be sent by God to spend three years teaching, preaching, baptizing, and Mark chapter 1 says he baptized for the remission of sins. And then have to do all that all, all over again. I mentioned this illustration back in uh, Solomon's day when 185,000 men worked for seven years getting the temple, Solomon's temple ready. They, for those seven years, built stones according to certain prescribed uh, areas. And when it came time for the temple to be erected, they pushed the stones they had prepared all those years into place and now their temple was. I believe John's work was like that. He was preparing stones for the spiritual house of God. And when the kingdom that was nigh, that was at hand, that John and Jesus both spoke, came on Pentecost, then they were the living stones that made up the New Testament church. But there are those who say that even the apostles, who were John's disciples, had to be baptized again. To me, that's a very, very strange conclusion. Recently, someone said, but didn't on the Pente day of Pentecost, Peter say, repent and be baptized, every one of you? He didn't say every one of us, did he? He said every one of you who asked many brethren, what should we do? But be that as it may, and uh, I'm really not going to discuss that any further because that's not the point of this, and also what difference it makes. We're certainly not those who have been baptized under John's baptism, and no one's taught that for 2,000 years. But the first thing he did when he came to Ephesus was baptize 12 men into Christ who know only John's baptism. But in Acts 18, Apollos, who, if you continue in the study there, evidently had taught these people, only had to be taught the word of the Lord more perfectly. Now, how do you harmonize that? Why wasn't he baptized again? Because he was baptized when John's baptism was valid before Pentecost and was added to the church. But evidently after that, he or someone still taught John's baptism when it was no longer valid. But anyway, that's how you begin your introduction to the Ephesians. Acts 19. And uh, these are interesting background materials. But I believe by far the greatest thing about the church at Ephesus was Paul's speech to the elders of Ephesus. Now listen carefully. There is no greater work, no more honorable work, no more difficult, challenging work than being an elder, a shepherd, an overseer in the church of the Lord. The qualifications for such are found in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1. And the work of elders is found in Hebrews 13 and 1 Peter 5 and Titus chapter 1. Passages that tell us that elders are to oversee the flock of God which is among them. Meaning if we had elders here, they couldn't oversee any other congregation. Each congregation is self-governing autonomous. Also, they're to be able to convict and convince the gainsayer, Titus 1, 9, and 10, which means they must be able, qualified, skilled teachers 
apt to teach. One of the qualifications in the Greek is just one word for those three in the translation, apt to teach. The one word means skilled in teaching. So that sheds some light on the qualifications of elders. We don't vote the men because they're popular and we like them and because we need some more elders. You understand the qualifications of elders by the work of elders. Is a man able to do the work? Not if he isn't qualified, if he doesn't know enough. We don't put them in there like we put in a board of directors at a bank or trustees at a school. But Paul's speech to the elders of Ephesus is a classic. And it is the only full sermon we have in all the Bible where a Christian preached to other Christians. It tells us something about the love they had for one another. And at the end of that, when Paul thought he'd see their face no more, they knelt down and prayed together and wept together and we'd say hugged each other's neck, embraced one another. So when you talk about the book of Ephesians, you've got some powerful, rich background. Introduction before we ever study one word in this epistle. We've got a lot of brethren who think they know the book of Acts that haven't yet discovered that the book of Acts is the history book for most of the books which follow. Before you read one line of Ephesians for personal study, go back and read Acts 19 and 20. And you've been introduced to the background, to the congregation that was in Ephesus. And then when you go all the way to Revelation and realize Ephesus was one of the seven congregations whom that book was addressed, we're talking about a very influential and important and challenged congregation. So there are a lot of things here before we ever study one word in Ephesians that will help the rest of this study and the rest of this book make more sense. But a lot of people read and study in a disconnected way. And they jump right in the middle of something that they know nothing about and then wonder why they're confused. It isn't God's fault. We would never, ever study anything else like we studied the Bible. We'd be more thorough. We'd get more background. We'd know where we were when we started. And one of the most enthralling things, and I've studied a bunch of different things and so forth, uh, one of the most enthralling things about the Bible is how it is connected. From the very first word of Genesis 1-1 to the last syllable of Revelation 22-21, it's connected. Three main teachings of the whole Bible. The Old Testament, Christ is coming. First part of the New Testament, Christ did come. Next to the last statement in the whole Bible, Revelation 22, 21, he's coming again. There's never ever been any such book written by 40 different people over a period of 1,600 years that makes sense from the very first word. But to disconnect this from especially... Uh, meaningful background the book of acts is to come off half cocked unprepared and then blame god because we didn't understand something you can pretty well mark it down to what the early bible prophets wrote christ and his apostles quote so trust no creed that trembles to recall what has been penned by one and verified by all that old poem serves there very well now and only now are we ready to delve into the very first verse here i paul an apostle of jesus christ by the will of god to the saints which are at ephesus so you don't have to be dead 400 years and the pope canonize you to make you a saint that's catholic doctrine here he's writing to christians alive in the middle of the first century and he calls them saints christ the am one who belongs to christ is a saint meaning called out separated from the world pure and holy unto god it's much like sanctified it's really much like the Greek word for church, ecclesia, called out, uniquely the Lord's, in the midst of the whole wide world. Here are people who are unique in the whole world. So you don't have to be perfect to be a saint. That's Catholic doctrine, or voted in by the Pope after they've been dead four centuries. He's writing to people alive and on earth in the middle of the first century, and he calls them saints. But let's get uh, a little more overview of what we're going to find in these books and then we'll study each word in each chapter before we're through just like we did with Galatians and Second Corinthians. In striving to get the point across that God will foreordain, predestined before the world that the church would be established, Christ would come, 
the gospel would be preached. Uh, we need to realize how honored we are if indeed we're members of the church he promised before the world began and purpose that we have a high and holy calling and a deep responsibility. We're not talking about the Kiwanis Club here. We're talking about the New Testament church that's different than any other thing that ever existed on earth. It's not a denomination. It's not guided by a creed book written by men. We have no theological seminary. I noticed this other day in another mail out from the school I graduated from that just used to be just a general uh, college. Now they're putting in a theological seminary. If they use theological once, they use it 40 times. Well, when I was going to school back there, that was taught against in the school. Now they, this old boy said, they, they is one. I just can't believe how people can change. And their conscience not even bother them. You see, that's half eluding. That'll bring in more dollars from industry and so forth. And it's also going to bring in a theological concept that unless we put our stamp upon you, you can't preach in the churches we represent. Have I got news for them? They don't represent the church. One is divine and the other is secular. But that's how people stray because they don't stick with the book. They're impressed with fancy, journalistic, highly sophisticated printing material more than what the simple New Testament has taught for 2,000 years. That's why I'm still working on an article I'm going to call Somebody Stole My Alma Mater. Sad. So in this, we're going to come face to face with the fact that if we are indeed members of the church you read about in the Bible, we are tied on to eternity. We have a high and holy calling that demands the best of all of us. All right, let's go back to the first verse. I, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, in the New Testament, to where he uses grace and mercy and peace, grace means unmerited favor or gift of God, something we uh, don't deserve. Mercy is when he doesn't give us what we do deserve. And peace does not mean there's no problems. It means we have the ability to bear up under stress. It doesn't mean the absence of trouble. It means the ability to bear up when trouble comes. And that's real peace. The world cannot take it from us. We may be persecuted, imprisoned, like Paul and Silas and Barnabas were, but we still have inward tranquility the world doesn't comprehend. When Paul and Silas sang praise unto God at midnight and the prisoners heard them, I'm sure the prisoners thought, what's wrong with those people? They've been beaten half to death and thrown in the innermost prison, and they're praising God, and they wouldn't be in prison were it not for their attachment to God, and they're singing praise unto God who allowed them to be so persecuted. What's wrong with that? But that's the kind of peace the Bible speaks of, <clears throat> an inward tranquility. Grace be to you in peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord, word Lord means master. Jesus means Savior. Christ means the anointed one of God. So that's not repetitious. It's specializing on a certain aspect of our Lord. He's our master. He's our Savior. He's God's anointed one. In other words, pay attention to him. He has the right credentials. <clears throat> Blessed be, and that means we thank God for, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Where are spiritual blessings in Christ? Where are all spiritual blessings? in Christ so there's not a single spiritual blessing that isn't located in Christ that's what he's saying exactly what he's saying according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love so we're not to be carnal worldly shallow earthy we're to be holy and without blame that doesn't mean we've never made a mistake it means we've corrected the mistakes when we were to be blamed. Therefore, we're no longer to be blamed about the mistakes we once were blamed with because we made them right. How do I know that? Peter said he was an apostle, 1 Peter 5, 1, and yet Paul rebuked Peter when he was to be blamed, Galatians chapter 2. Now, how could he be an elder when you have to be blameless to be an elder and he once was blamed 
by another apostle when he was wrong because he made the wrong right. If we had to wait for someone who never made a mistake, we'd have to wait for Jesus. He's the only one who never made a mistake. But we can be without blame, though once we were to be blamed because we made what we were blamed about right. That's the beautiful thing about Christianity. Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins. To whom was I spoken? Saul of Tarsus who persecuted the church. He was a blasphemer, 1 Timothy 1. Chief of sinners, 1 Timothy 1, 15. Now notice he's speaking of our Heavenly Father. Having predestinated us under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. I've heard many, many members of the church say predestination is never taught in the Bible. Well, we just read that. Go over here to uh, verse 11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him. There's predestined uh, twice in the first chapter. Now, what should we say? Calvinistic predestination is not taught in the Bible. John Calvin probably had more influence on the religious world from 1500 to right now than any other single human being. There are more Calvinistic teachings in denominationalism than all the other church leaders put together. But he didn't teach what the Bible said. He used the word, but he applied it in a wrong sense. <clears throat> Calvinistic predestination is before you were born, before I was born, God predestined where we'd spend eternity. If he predestined I'd be saved, I couldn't do enough evil things to condemn me. If he predestined I'd be condemned, there's not enough good things I could do to save me. That's Calvinistic predestination, which is not taught in the Bible. But scriptural predestination, meaning since God is eternal, since he sees the end from the beginning, from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God, Psalm 90, verse 1 and 2, he can see what our destiny will be, but it'll be what we chose it to be. See, I've said before thee this day, life and good and death and evil. Deuteronomy 30, 15. Choose you this day whom you'll serve. Joshua 24, 15. And so we have the ability to make our own choices about our destiny, but God who is eternal can know what decision we made of our own volition. But he didn't predestine that we'd be lost or saved. He left that up to our choice. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them that fail severity, but toward thee goodness, if thou continue as goodness, otherwise thou also should be cut off. Romans eleven twenty two. So you have the ability and I have the ability to decide where we'll spend eternity. Again. I would always thought that uh, the predestined that God has the covenant he's given us a plan whereby those that conform to that plan are predestined to be his children and to live in uh, eternity. Those that, that do not uh, abide by that are predestined to perform it. That's exactly what I, what I believe and what I was saying in another way. I still believe one of the best things I ever heard years and years ago before I determined I was going to be a preacher. I was thinking about that, but I sat at the feet of a very brilliant older teacher, and he said, in regard to election, God voted for us, the devil voted against us, and we decide the final ballot. What do we decide? Are we going to go with God or with the devil? But what you said is true. Let, let me give you another example. In Ephesians 1, 3, all spiritual blessings are in Christ. Before the world began, God said, I'm ultimately going to put all spiritual blessings in Christ. Romans 8, 29 says we're to be conformed to his image. So here's the mold that God will predestine before the world began. All who will be saved must match the mold, the pattern of my son. Now, if we choose, as Ned said, to be in that mold and follow that pattern, we'll be saved. But here's the mold. Someone says, I don't like that. I like what the devil in the world offers. I, I fit into this better. He'll spend eternity regretting it. We are creatures of choice. Put this down. Don't forget it. Leviticus 1.3. Of your own voluntary will. There's where heaven left it. He wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. First Timothy 2, 4. That's his will. That all men be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Second Peter 3, 9. 
So it's an action on our, on our part. Eternity has been prepared. I go prepare a place for you, Jesus said, John 14, 1 to 3. But some people want a detour of their own choice that will wind them up in hell. They receive not a love of the truth that they might be saved. 2 Thessalonians 2, 10 to 12. Here's what you must do to be saved, to match this mold, to live and die in Christ. I don't want that, Lord. He doesn't say, I'm going to take you by the neck and force you into this mold, whether you want it or not. That isn't what the Bible teaches. One of the all-time best is Revelation 3.20. Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. If that contingency. The last paragraph of the Bible, Revelation 22.17, begins with, Whosoever will, let him come. One little boy said, Our problem is there are too many whosoever wants. So, the idea of predestination is not Calvinistic predestination. The idea of predestination is a loving Heavenly Father who made us, has prepared heaven, and wants us all to go there and none to be lost, said, here's what you do to get there. If we humbly surrender His will, submit to His commands, that reward is there. He doesn't take you by the nap of the neck and throw you in the baptistry. He wants us to obey Him. In fact, uh, Romans 6 says we must obey him from the heart. You obey the form of doctrine delivered you. You do it willingly from your own heart. But those who say, I don't like that doctrine. I'm not about to do that. I'm going to do my own thing. will rue the day they thought like that. <coughs> Saul of Tarsus said, before I was a blasphemer. Injurious. Did many things contrary. I was chief of sinners. But when he approached the Lord, he said, Lord, what will you have me to do? So that's where God's predestination and man's obedience and submission mesh and blend. But to say the Bible nowhere teaches predestination, you run into these two verses here. You need to understand what the word meant and then what Calvin means. I never shall forget when I was teaching Odessa High School years ago. It was the largest high school in the state of Texas at that time. It was before they'd built two more high school buildings in Odessa. When Odessa had about 100,000 people in a 50,000 population town. Uh, but I never shall forget at noon, two or three different days, uh, when I was uh, teaching there, I had a running discussion with one of the teachers who was an ardent uh, member of the Presbyterian Church, which is the offshoot of Calvin's religion and uh, I guess no one ever talked to him about these passages about these principles and as a result no one was shouting or hollering or anything uh, but uh, as the Bible just pressed him and pressed him and pressed him I could see how frustrated he was and he tried to get mad and I wouldn't let him and I just calmly presented these passages and everybody at two or three tables there Faculty and students could see it as clear as the noonday sun that that fellow was fighting a losing battle, not because of me, but because of the clear scriptures. And I really felt sorry for him. But from the first time he remembered anything, he had been taught, had been crammed into his mind that John Cow was the greatest thing that ever happened in the history of the world besides Jesus. Though he taught contrary to simple principles and plans all the way. For instance, so did Noah, according to all that God commanded him. God commands, no obey. So did Moses according to all that God commanded him. Genesis 6, Exodus 40. So only those who do God's will match the mold that he predestined before the world began. He didn't predestine individuals. He predestined the gospel, the church, Christianity, godly living. Now do we choose to walk that way and match those molds? We need to be careful and uh, identify the kind of predestination the Bible never mentions. Having predestined us under the adoption of children, remember in Galatians, we're the adopted children of God. He has only one son, the only begotten son of God, but he has many adopted sons, those who are willing to be adopted by him according to his will. Under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. So our cooperation with the will of God is what makes salvation obtainable. To the praise of the glory of his grace, 
wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. That's a beautiful phrase, isn't it? And uh, remember, to the glory of his grace. If I go to heaven, if you go to heaven, we'll be saved by the grace of God. It won't be because we did so many good deeds. We knock on the door of heaven and say, you've got to let us in. We are so godly, so spiritual. We don't even need your grace. We saved ourselves by ourselves. That won't be true. No one deserves heaven. It's a gracious thing that he gives to those who obey him. Another thing, those who think the grace of God is better felt than told and you can't bring it down to a reasonable understanding, Paul said, I preach. Now listen to this. I preach the gospel of the grace of God. Acts 20, 24. So when I find out what the gospel is, I'll know how we can be saved by the grace of God. I preach the gospel of the grace of God. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 14, Paul said, we're called by the gospel. Not by some still small voice out of the atmosphere, better felt and told. We're called by the gospel. We're saved by the gospel. We must obey the gospel. All the way. Peter said, what should be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? 1 Peter 4, 17 and 18. So when you put all of these passages together, you see that God wants us to be saved, sent his son to die for every one of us. By the grace of God, Jesus tasted of death for every man. Hebrews 2 9. God's done his part. And he gave the clarion call of the gospel plan of salvation. And when we lovingly obey it, we're called by his grace. We'll be saved by his grace. Not because we earned or deserved it. We ought to think about that in the way we word matters. Because today, we have brethren not 50 miles from here. I know what I'm talking about. Who believe we're saved by grace and grace alone. And obedience has nothing to do with it. That's just not true. Paul preached the gospel of the grace of God. So the gospel must be as essential as anything. So the good news, the glad tidings about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, which we manifest and convey and portray when we become dead to sin as we're buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in a new life. The same Paul that spoke of the gospel of the grace of God taught that in Romans 6, 1-5. So when you think of God's plan and man's obedience and our purpose and our usefulness in the arrangement called salvation and redemption, we have God's part and man's part. And that's being laughed at today by many. I have a sermon on the chain of salvation. It takes the grace of God, the blood of Christ, the gospel of Christ. That's God's part. It takes our belief and our repentance and our baptism and our Christian living and endurance and hope the Bible teaches all of those things are essential in the chain of salvation. God's part and man's part. And why would a man say, I don't have anything to do and I'm not going to do anything? It's not Bible teaching. All right, remember Sunday morning we'll come back and finish chapter 1 in Bible class and have chapter 2 Sunday night. So be studying thoroughly these passages and these references.